Hello and welcome to the Animation Communication Podcast, your source for discussion about animation, film, fandom, and more. So please join our host, I Love Kim Possible A Lot, or KP, for today's discussion. If you like what you hear, please remember to show support by giving a like, follow, as well as subscribing to the main I Love Kim Possible A Lot channel on YouTube. Spread the word, and thank you for being part of our community. This episode contains some mild adult language. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's month's whatever's episode of my podcast called Animation Communication. You get it? With It's a K because it's a pun. Anyway, that's a very old joke. So I'm KP. Um, if you don't know that, then welcome to your first episode. We have a lot of episodes that are in the, the archive if you're new for some reason, turning into episode 75 or whatever it is. Um, Merry Christmas. It's Christmas time of this recording. So, you know, by the time it's released, hopefully we'll still be Christmas adjacent. So anyway, um, so I have a very uh, special announcement. Um, So we have our new um, co-host, as you probably guys could tell just in the general midst of everything. um, Brittle and I are still good friends, but He's not uh, the best with a lot of social interact, not social interaction, I should say. He's, he has a lot of social anxiety and he just wasn't feeling this. So we tried di- different ways to make it work and it just wasn't working. So um, I invited Thomas to be our new co-host. And Thomas, um, if you d- guys didn't remember Thomas, he was in our internet safety, um, real talk for internet safety um, episode. So we kind of already like... That's why he's not getting a standalone like, hey, me and our new co-host episode right now because he technically already had one kind of sort of. So, hey, hey, I'll, I'll be addressing him as Thomas, but if you guys prefer Leo or Leo Convoy or whatever his username, then, you know, I don't, whatever. Um, so, hey, hey, Thomas, how are you? Doing all right. You said previously about an old joke, which is why I'd imagine I'm here. I'm kind of old. There we go. Yay! So anyway, um, he seems pretty cool. So uh, we'll just we'll just go at it. So um, hi guys, how are you doing? Um, our guests are they have a better name besides guys, but we already like had a little banter before, so that's why I'm doing this. How are you doing, guys? <laughs> Very good. Thank you for yeah. having us. Yeah. yeah, doing great. Thanks for having us on the podcast. Of course. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, tell us a little bit about your your group name and your group and like how you kind of. How did you meet each other? Let's start there. Ooh, 22 years ago, we were <laughs> just barely 20 something. Well, first, first tell them your name. Oh, sorry. Right. I'm Brian Pickett. I'm co owner, uh, one of three owners, composers of Voodoo Highway Music and Post. Uh, and we score a ton of kids' cartoons and some stuff that's not cartoons, but mostly, mostly kids' cartoons. <laughs> By not kids cartoons, do you still mean like children's program or programming or? We do some, we do, we do some advertisements the odd time um, and the odd documentary and the odd show for grownups. Okay. So, some video game work as well. We've sort of dabbled a little bit uh, in a, a little bit of, into all the different uh, mediums. Uh, but uh, I also wanted to, the reason I sound all, all sort of off kilter is because I didn't introduce myself. <laughs> My name is James Chapel, and I'm one of the other three uh, co-owners of Voodoo Highway, and today uh, Graham Corney is our third business partner is missing, but he's the third member of our uh, Ninja Turtles group. I guess there's four Ninja Turtles, <laughs> but we're down to three or whatever. So, uh, no doubt to tell. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we primarily score animation. That's sort of our bread and butter. We fell into that many, many moons ago. Uh, but, you know, that's not always what we did. Uh, we did a lot of uh, reality television, and we've done some, uh, like, live-action scripted shows, some features, some video game work, kind of a little bit of everything, like I was mentioning. Um, but you asked how we started. So do you want to, Brian, do you want to queue up, like, how you and I met? Sure. Um, it was in college. I just graduated college, and I went back. Well, you know what? Maybe I should get that far. But, well, uh, it's a good point though because we went to the same college. That's, cool. that's yeah. yeah, we graduated from the same program called Music Industry Arts, uh, that's and that's at a college uh, called Fanshawe College in London, Ontario, Canada. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, we're Canadians, if you can't tell, eh? 
<laughs> yeah, there's I, I I'm blanking on their na- on the name, but there's a there's a good chunk of Canadian animation education um, up there, and there's a pretty good there's a couple of different good schools. There's a couple studios that people, you know, shared in college. Yeah, shared not shared. In, yeah, so sometimes you know you either see like the post work done in Canada, or some people leaking in from Canada to L.A., and you know we don't know how to stop them. So, <laughs> yeah, it's got a very healthy. Um animation industry in toronto specifically and can and vancouver but um you know a lot of people don't know like obviously paw patrol which we score is a uh, almost uh, I, I think aside from the writers and some of the producers it's all canadian canadian actors and um host and animators i i do have to ask did you guys see the the saturday night live paw patrol sketch Actually, no, no I didn't even what? know there was one. Oh, it's great. Um, I'll, 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 I'll we, st- saw the, we saw the robot chicken one. <laughs> <laughs> it, was pretty, it was pretty hardcore. Okay. So we've talked about this a few times. Okay, so like we're sort of devolving from the original how we met, but, the, but this is sort of funny because there's sort of these pop culture, pop culture ben- benchmarks. Wow, that's yeah. a tongue twister, huh? Pop culture, um, pop culture benchmarks. Uh, that we sort of look at over the years, like when there was a Paw Patrol float in the Thanksgiving Day Parade, in the Macy's Parade. Uh, there was a question on Jeopardy at one point. There was a robot chicken sketch. Like these are all the re- these are all the checklists of like, oh, this show has made it in pop culture, right? Mm-hmm. But Saturday Night Live, that's a whole other level now. Like I didn't know that there was a Saturday Night Live one. So yeah. Thanks um, for filling us in there. We got to check that out. Oh yeah, it was great. Um, it was Oscar Isaac, and it was basically just poking the fun at the um the non practicality of of the Paw Patrol brand. Oh my God, when basically, did this air? Like a year ago. It was it was a while no, ago. Nobody even told us. That. That's crazy, right? <laughs> you guys didn't get like, an email. Someone in a meeting would have mentioned that, right? Like people forget about the composers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's um, awesome. Right, I'm going to look that up as soon as we're done today. Yeah, totally. Add that to yeah. the list. Thanks for the heads up. Yeah, you got Daniel it. Tigers and we also write the music for a show called Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is kind of a spinoff from uh, Mr. Rogers' show. It's his universe, um, but it was also spoofed on Robot Chicken. <laughs> oh. Well. Yeah. You know, so that's it. I was going to be like, so, Mr. Yeah, Rogers just... is, is good is good stuff. So, you know. Absolutely. Also just to again, quickly but... mention just some of the shows that we work on, just so that you're Oh, yeah, of aware. course, of course. Go yeah, ahead, plug. Yeah, so there's Paw, Paw Patrol is, is, and Daniel Tiger are probably the big two, but uh, we've also scored the Total Drama franchise since its inception, I think <laughs> since 2007, and we're gearing up cartoon. to do the new season uh, for HBO and BBC currently. Um, what else? What am I missing? Uh, Back to Gone, yeah. Which uh, is on uh, Netflix, I believe, and Cartoon Network. The new George uh, of the Jungle? George of the Jungle. We've done Cat in the Hat, a number of uh, specials and episodes of Cat in the Hat. Uh, sometimes I have to look up our IMDb because <laughs> I forget some of, the, some of the shows. Like, there's a bunch of other shows like Almost Naked Animals and Stoked and Garage Band. Like, a bunch of shows that have sort of come and gone that were quality but didn't quite have the staying power mm-hmm. uh but i would say yeah mainly the the big three we're working on is total drama paw patrol and daniel tiger uh we recently started work on the paw patrol spin-off series as well so which is going to be fun mm-hmm. okay yeah that's that, that's a lot of things um wow yeah so yeah there's a lot at once yeah I, <laughs> your, your press release didn't cover all of the things but you know staying power um since you brought that up i was curious um from your perspective like what do you think the staying power is like the oddball of all of that seems to be total drama um so that thing keeps on i mean i don't i don't watch very religiously but i watch i kind of keep an eye out for it and they keep on getting like additional um i want to say spin-offs but they're not spin-offs at the same time so what what is your perspective as far as like the the longevity of that franchise Mm, that's a good call. You know, it found its audience quite early. Mm-hmm. Um, which, by the way, we knew it was an amazing show. It was the first season was very Canadian, <laughs> and then it caught on. Like there are so many Canadian references. You know, they made fun of Celine Dion quite a bit, and uh, who is obviously worldwide. But it caught on in the states uh, extremely well and extremely quickly. And I think um, they start that cult kind of following. And they've stuck with it mm-hmm. as grown-ups, as, as adults. I see a lot of 
belt still discussing it, uh, you know, and nostalgic. And uh, so I, 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 I think know. you nailed it, Brian. I think that's that's what it is. Is that the kids who, well, teen like tweens, teens who originally watched it have grown up with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, like I did an interview on the one of the fan pages a couple of years ago with. Uh, you know, uh, uh, 20 somethings, like 25, 26 year old adults, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we're talking about this cartoon show. uh, And I'm still part of that fan group. So I see their posts every day. And they're, you know, they're very excited for the new season, probably more so than the actual target audience. So, uh, so I think that it yeah, I think there's a nostalgia that that is part of the reason why it keeps coming back around. Um, I'd give um, I would give some credit i was just thinking too the the particular humor of, of tom mcgillis and jen birch uh the creators and writers of there were two of the creators and the the main writers of the show and they have a very um i don't know how to describe their sense of humor but it's uh it's a little twisted <laughs> it's just so funny like i can't uh like you know as as you know grown up once again i'm laughing it's one of our favorite shows to work on for that. This I'm I'm in line with their humor, and I find it very funny. But I think it uh, I think it translates to a lot of people. It's just a really funny show. Oh, there's yeah. also a lot of character development, maybe even more so than any of the other shows we work on, actually, because there's oh. very intricate, dramatic plot lines for each character over each season, and I see that too. Because again, on this fan group, I see all the people talk sh- like talking about all the ships, like shipping, oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and everything. <laughs> And uh, they're deep into it, right? So it's kind of neat it, from that perspective. I think there's a lot more character development uh, yeah, on that show. It really uh, keyed into the teen or tween drama, I guess, tween romance, tween drama between, yeah. and it, you know, for once again, a, a group of adults making a show, for, you know, kids, they really figured it out, figured out the format. Oh, yeah, and yeah. We should swing back real quick though, because I feel bad like we didn't quite totally answer the how we met or how we got started. But but like we we did go to the same college, but Brian was actually a year ahead of me, and mm-hmm. then Brian, you were working at a studio in Toronto. I was working in a dubbing room for two years. Um, which if you've ever worked in a dubbing room, it's actually it was a great uh, job, and I loved my coworkers in the place. But it, and it was but it's like you know you don't really move up very quickly. And I was, and I wanted to write music, you know, I just wanted to. Um, and how old were you at the time? I was 23. Right. I was 24. When I, and these guys, we, uh, James and Dave, our original, one of our original founding partners was, were kind of spinning their wheels in Toronto, working on an indie film, audio post and composition. For it was it. an absolute nightmare. Yeah, they were in, they were in hell. So, in a living, a really bad living situation. So I reached out to them and I said, hey, you know, they, um, the studio I worked at, it was called Mandy Eastern. It was one of the, you know, premier, it's now condos, but it was one of the- <laughs> Back the in first, the day. <laughs> yeah, like all the Anne Marie's albums. It was that. the Canadian studio, period. Yeah, like awesome. it was, yeah, it was like the place, yeah. But like Abbey Road in Canada. Canada. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's a shame. Uh, that it's now condos, but they had, um, by the time I started working there dubbing, all the clients, they had long stopped doing rock albums. You know, like I said, they were doing before in the six, in the seventies and eighties, they did almost all the Anne Murray records and stuff. Anyways, by the time I started working there, it was all, um, ads. So jingle writers would re- record their orchestras there because they had a huge room or whatever there, or whatever was there. Some, some film scores came in. Anyways, I was working there and I saw all these composers composers coming in, you know, they'd rent the studio and they'd bring in players. That's what they were doing. And they'd mix the jingles there, which they weren't really jingles. They weren't like your traditional jingles. They were commercial music. And I just thought it was the best. I I thought these guys had the coolest life. Um, And I wanted to do that same thing. So I approached these guys about, why don't we try this? You know, just take a shot at it and yeah. So we basically, it's so, it's super weird. Like, it feels like it's a script or something now when I look back on it. Like, who writes this stuff? We got the email from Brian literally the day after we basically kind of got let go from this project that we were working on. And we were trying to figure out, like, what, what's our next move? Like, what are we going to do? And I was 21. Oh, wow. Maybe even, just, maybe even just 20. It was, I was pretty young. I had hair then and everything. Um, and yeah, long time ago. And so... We were like, what are we going to do? And we randomly got this email from Brian and we were so young 
that it didn't matter. We we're just like, yeah, let's do it. Like we've nothing to lose at that age. And which is a blessing, right? Like you just like, let's, I'll try anything. And uh, yeah, here we are 23 years later and multiple, multiple shows later. Like I, I thought it would go well. I did. I, I didn't think it would go this well. Uh, and I knew Brian, but I'd only met him once. Uh, so uh, and we got along really well. And then um, what was the first stuff? Oh, the first gig we ever did was a workout video that didn't have a click track to it. So they were just randomly exercising, and we had to try to match the music to their like. I mean, just the worst first gig you could ever think of uh, three and three one hour exercise videos yeah the like hours of dance music yeah hey, and uh, it was uh oh goodness uh, Catherine Winnick who is now a star on Vikings and uh went on, has gone on to like an illustrious film and television career she's a uh, triple uh, triple black uh, degree black belt in taekwondo yeah uh, which is what this exercise video was to taekwondo anyway we're Put yeah. an asterisk beside that for trivia of the day because I didn't know that. But anyway, that was our first gig. And it was like a nightmare. Everything sucked. And it was a very depressing time. I tell this because uh, I don't want to paint the picture that like our whole career has just been like rainbows and lollipops and stuff. It's been pretty, uh, it, the, the, especially the early days were particularly stressful and depressing. The first um, five years. I've always said the first five yeah. years. Yeah. We got our first successful TV show. Uh, you know, we had all, lots of lots of uh, ads we did. We did all the PlayStation advertising in Canada, like music for all the advertising. And, and you know, those were good, but they didn't, you know, they, then they paid the bills, barely. But, um, yeah, it was <laughs> until we got, uh, yeah, our first real TV show that um, that we actually felt like we had, a, the, like we had started to make it. And that took And I'm not even sure if it's our first. It might have been our second, but Rich Bride, Poor Bride was the big... Uh, yeah, the big one that really like, turned the corner for us. We did seven seasons of that, and it was a reality show about weddings and budgets of weddings and stuff. But the interesting thing was that, and we've talked about this before, is that this sort of led in a way to us pitching for Total Drama uh, because we had done so much sort of reality TV, <laughs> and, they, and they were looking for composers to do like reality television for this <laughs> animated show. Yeah. And it, and one thing just really led right into the next. And Graham always has this great saying about following the breadcrumbs of our career. And I this is like the perfect example. Uh, and that's always what I tell young composers too, is like, don't fight the path before you. Just follow those breadcrumbs and see where it leads you. Because we weren't planning on getting into animation. It mm -hmm. just, one door opens into the next, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, so that's how that really helped us land Total Drama. And once we landed Total Drama, that opened all the doors for us in animation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, yeah, that's great. Uh, well, it's, it's nice to see that you guys, like, because, like, the, the, the reality is sometimes, especially for, for young people, is that, like, they want to do this creative thing, but their parents are like, where's the money in that? And they just kind of go through stages of depression until like they finally find something that pays the bills and then eventually from paying the bills to like something they might actually want to do. So it's nice to always like hear that like the professional people have those kind of stories too instead of just like, oh, it's great, it's butterflies and rainbows and we have so much money, so. Indeed. Yeah, I would go as far as to say it sucks. Like early on, it's like a total, it was, it's like pretty bad. <laughs> Let's just I would never rainbows. recommend it. Some guys strike, you know, some people strike gold right out of the bat. That's true. And, uh, but I, I don't think, I think that's a very thin min minority uh, that uh, manages to land great things right out of the gates. But um, I think the benefit too, and the advice I'd always give someone, say, coming out of college too, is that uh, start early in your career. Like, you know, when we were 21 or 22, we had, I could live, I remember I figured it out and I could live off like six, seven hundred dollars a month, you know. Like I couldn't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also other factors like kids and yeah. life stuff starts to hap starts to take over, and family stuff and other obligations. But when you're 21 and it's like, yeah, I can stay up till 8 a.m. working on this thing and like sleep for two hours and then get back to it. Like you can destroy your body. You Nonstop know? energy. Yeah. No, totally. You don't need, you don't need to money. Do you, do you guys have yeah. monster energy drinks in Canada? Uh, yeah, we have Red Bull. 
Oh, Red yeah, Bulls. Red Bull, too. Okay, Red Bull's also yeah. a good staple. But... I never got into energy drinks. I'm a coffee guy. I'm old school. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, we used to drink a pot, two pots of coffee a day. And, like, yeah, it was totally insane. That, now, listen, there's sort of fun memories of it, too, right? Like, it was sort of the golden age of all of our lives and stuff. So there's sort of some good memories and stuff to it, too. But I would just caution anyone, like, if you're going to get into it, you have to really love it. And because uh, it's good, it's not going to be easy. And yeah, like you're mentioning too about, uh, you know, the parents saying like, where's the money and stuff like we were very fortunate that we had parents that were very supportive the whole mm -hmm. way too. So we've just been really just very fortunate and, and kind of had the perfect storm of meeting each other at the right age at the right time with the right skill set in the right city. So James's parents gave us a, a, a business loan. A small business loan to pay our rent for. Oh, for that's nice. Oh, that's that true. Great. Yeah, we could have done it without without them. So, yeah. yeah, I was very fortunate to have very supportive parents that uh, supported my music. Yeah. I started music lessons when I was like three, and uh, they and I played the organ. So they would always be like carting my organ around. To <laughs> something. So, yeah, so they were really cool and a big part of my my success as well. So. Yeah, we're just very fortunate, though. And if, if someone doesn't have those kinds of uh, support networks and all that, like, it can make it even more difficult, so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, the the reason I created the podcast, too, is to kind of give people educational opportunities, like, for nice. they, who don't have access to, you know, like, something I learned, you know, especially in the American system is that, like, you know, where you go to school and, like, like those kind of opportunities can make or break you. And I feel like some people who, you know, maybe either don't necessarily have those kind of opportunities or they live in a really rural town and, like, you know, going to art college isn't realistic or going, you know, wherever, um, they can still kind of at least pick up the pieces and, you know, do something and, you know, try to push through. But, yeah, it can be hard, you know, even if you do have all the resources available. So, yeah, it's good. Again, it's 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 great to hear your guys' um, perspective kind of thing. Um, um, so I guess we'll move on to more of a technical question. So I think I think we've covered this before on the podcast, but just from your perspective, too, as far as, um, you know, like what stages of like when you're spe specifically for animation so what stages of um the production are you guys usually involved in and like what kind of material do you get for uh composition work so some people get animatics sometimes people get like you know un like edited like final stuff but it's been uncomped and the lighting still needs to be done there's like still you know more post stuff to do so like especially for television like what stages of uh what kind of material do you guys get for composing and like do things change a lot during the uh the process and um you know how does that whole doing your job thing work well it's a, I, we could talk about this for 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, because we write songs for uh, a lot of the cartoons uh, the songwriting happens you know even before the voice records oh wow uh, especially yeah. daniel tiger to point out i think we write like 80 songs a year or maybe 120 it's a lot of songs per season yeah, four songs per episode, typically, plus the odd and odds and ends. Uh, and that happens at the script stage. They get a completed script and they send it off to us. And uh, the song, the scripts have the song direction in it and some uh, wording ideas. And it usually has the hook lyrics, uh, the meaning the chorus, to what ends up being the chorus of the songs. And we start, uh, you know, we write the songs then and we go through a whole approval process. Um, you know, I think it takes us maybe, a, you know, we're overlapping. We're, we're writing us i think we write a new song every two weeks and then revise a song every two weeks so it's uh, like every other week anyways um and then songs are complete usually around the time the scoring starts on the first episode i think usually if it's 20 episodes 26 episodes usually by the time you're done the songs you're just starting the score um which is usually about a, a year later i would say in typically typical timing um we've had some interesting and usually, I mean, we prefer to start, we prefer, prefer to score to final picture. Um, because, you know, obviously, or at least some kind of timing lock that's close because we can nip, nudge and all that. But that's one thing, uh, you know, it's pretty tricky. You score everything and then all of a sudden a, a scene that's right in the middle of one of your cues gets moved to a different area. You know, so we try to, uh, we try to push it back as far. But we usually uh, try to do a little sample. And this is uh, something that we've just learned in the last 20 years if you're <laughs> gonna score 20 minutes of music write 20 minutes of music 
you better make sure they know what they're in for before showing them the whole 20 minutes. So we usually score like a two minute sample of, uh, we even sometimes do an animatic. It's early on because mm -hmm. we want to find the sound early and uh, make sure everyone signs off. And we, we, uh, we invite them to share it with the network, with everyone who's got a say in it, like, you know, just get signed off on the sound. And then um, once everyone, you know, we will workshop that two minutes, uh, two, three minutes. And once everyone signs off on it, we, um, you know, we start the first episode and we just go, um, you know, get push the pedal to the metal and score through the first 20 minutes. And then, yeah. Um, as far as animatics, I'll give you one quick story. Refer, like, as far as animatics go, we did uh, <clears throat> season two of the relaunch of Georgia the Jungle, as we mentioned. It was 26 episodes and the whole thing was very delayed. Um, when it finally got on the rails, they were trying to deliver two 26, no, two 22 minute episodes per week completed. Um, you know, we're fast, but I didn't, I don't think we could have completed um, at that, that pace, you know? So we actually asked to start early and we got all our animatics and we actually scored um, the first six episodes to their animatics. So by the time they started coming, we were at a normal pace. So then, then we had a music editor go through and retime everything, retime all our score. Because luckily things didn't change that enough that it was, you know, noticeable from the animatic to the final picture. So that's my animatic, Georgia and the Jungle Star. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> first time, yeah, first time we had ever done that. I forgot about that. I think I've blocked out a lot of things over the years, my friend. <laughs> uh, the stress level is so high that it's hard to retain some of these some of these stories sometimes because you just sort of block it out. Like, oh yeah, I. Um, I you gotta clear those ones, back, those memories out sometimes. <laughs> My favorite George of the Jungle story, though, I've told this one before too, is like one time they, the producers were like, "Hey guys, we need to get on a conference call like immediately," and we were like, "Usually that means, oh no, like there's trouble." Yeah. <laughs> and we got we got on this call, and they were all sitting around a speakerphone, like there was probably four or five people in the room, and we're bracing ourselves, and the fellow was just like, "Oh, great job, guys! We just want to tell you, you guys are." kicking ass and doing <laughs> awesome what a great job this amazing we were like oh oh thanks. all right like, yeah so there's a good that's what i remember of george this is like the positive of george of the jungle there um yeah i was just gonna add to like you know there's not any one thing that we work to it depends on the show it depends on on like in paw patrol we're basically working to almost completed animation because we're on season nine or ten now or whatever um and then with some of these other shows yeah it could be as early as the Leica phase uh recently we did some stuff where one of the writers actually sang a song into his iphone and then they put that up to the Leica and then we scored the song that he basically co-composed with us so that was an interesting uh challenge so you just sort of never know what phase of production you're gonna get and mm -hmm. uh it could be almost completed or super, super, super rough sketches, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like a big determining factor is like how important the music is for the actual like content, you know? Um, not that all music is like not, it, you know, as far as like is music telling more of the story specifically than, you know, the yeah. dialogue and that kind of thing. So I imagine like, again, children's show, like the early children's show where there's a lot of sing songy stuff, you know, that, you know, has to be written or at least, you know, designed a little bit earlier in the pro in the process because it's just such a fundamental part of the whole the whole picture um, from what you guys are telling me so to score in uh, and it doesn't happen all the time that's why I think it's really fun when it does happen is when we get to kind of like with the Daniel Tiger songs I guess is when we get to write the music before the animation's even been created mm -hmm. and then we get to see how they animated to our music. Uh, the one, one of my favorites was we got to write a bunch of songs for Cat in the Hat uh, and with Martin Short singing, another fellow Canadian. So yep. we were kind of Canadian nerding out on that <laughs> one. Um, but uh, so we, he got, he sang a bunch of these songs and I specifically, and I'm sure Brian and Graham did the same kind of thing, but there was like a moment where I was like, oh, I'm going to do a thing here that sounds like the can can. And maybe hopefully they can animate something to that. Like we got to, we got to kind of help tell the story with our music ahead of time. And it's, it's super, it's like a rush when you get to see the animation and see what the animators picked up on that you laid down musically. Cause it's usually the opposite. Mm -hmm. So that's always, that's always fun for me. Well, absolutely. 
Yeah, uh, I, I cut out a little bit near the end, but like I'm going to pretend it didn't happen for the sake of post, but yeah. Um. <laughs> no worries. Uh, imagine, Rachel, I'm not recording on this. Uh, <laughs> I don't really... Uh, <laughs> You want me to try hitting record again now? No, you're fine. You're fine. I think the whole call has been re being recorded. So, like, it's it will be an easy fix. But as far as, like, I didn't want to feel like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't paying attention yeah, to stuff. I'm recording on my end, too. Just <laughs> so, so is Maddie. Thank you, Maddie. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, we talked a lot about what you guys do. Like, um, do you have any specific favorites at this point in your careers? And, or... Um, why, if you wanted to like share some like anecdotes from things we haven't touched on yet? Uh, well, I will say uh, shows the the two shows that have always been a staple, at least starting I'd say 10, 20, 10 12 years ago, Paw Patrol and Daniel, and Total Drama, um, which have been around us with us almost our entire animation career, have been pretty amazing experiences and just pleasure to work on from the very beginning. Uh, to present day, uh, you know, the people have been, you know, being a bunch of nice Americans and, and nice Canadians, which are pretty much every Canadian <laughs> people, who work in, people who work in preschool are generally amazing people. So I, 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 I love the people we work with. Um, yeah, I feel like we've avoided a lot of the bad horror stories in, in the animation not animations, I shouldn't say animation. In the entertainment world that you hear. Yeah, we've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, um, no, go ahead. I'm trying to think of uh, any other particular experiences. Can you repeat your question, Rachel? Um, basically, what, if you guys had favorite? any f favorite projects or if you wanted to share any more anecdotes that we didn't touch on yet. Mm. I do have something to add to this, actually, which is... Uh, it's going to sound all cheesy and whatever, but, uh, you know, I think when we become artists and you choose to become an artist uh, as you're living, you know, the money and the income is very important and, you know, it's a job, but really there's another motivation underneath it all, right? Which is that you want to make people feel things and you want to maybe change the world or make the world, a not change the world, make the world a little bit better with your art, right? Mm -hmm. You want your art to resonate with people. And so as artists, we've been given this wonderful gift, right? Which is that millions of kids and families that every day get to experience our art and feel feelings and maybe it'll make their life just a little bit better, you know? And to me, that's like, that's the biggest reward that we can possibly get. So that's, a, that's one of the reasons why Paw Patrol, Daniel Tiger, Total Drama are probably my favorites to work on is just because of the reach that they have and the way that especially Daniel Tiger, uh, you know, actually actively helps kids, children deal with uh, emotional learning uh, and hopefully with the parents too, right? Like it's helping, we're being invited into people's homes every day and in just a little way being part of all their lives, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a gift. It's just an absolute gift. And so, um, yeah, so I think those are, that's why those are my favorite shows to work on as far as the, the reach that they get. Um, it also makes the late nights, uh, like the all the hard work and everything, it makes it worth it, you know? Um, but as far as a favorite show, like a project, like a personal, like, oh, this music's super fun, that would be Bakugan and probably a show that we did called Meta Jets a number of years ago which was all kind of like Star Wars-y kind of music and stuff like that. Those those shows are super fun to work on just because it's like, I get to use all these synthesizers and whatever, and, and guitar solos and stuff like that, you know. And it's that's for a little a, bit of an older crowd. So yeah, that, that's the flip side is, uh, I mean, mostly, especially James and I, uh, we uh, grew up listening to like Nine Inch Nails and pretty heavy, you know, ministry and pretty heavy music. Um, and then to shift into kids, you know, kids TV, it's nice. Back and gone, especially kind of brings in, we can get fairly industrial on that. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. It gets heavy. It, gets, yeah. it, it, it definitely gets, gets heavy. So we can scratch our heavy music itch. Well, and month. we co-composed uh, part of the score for uh, one of the Metal Gear games. Uh, oh, nice. Revengeons, like a number of years ago. I think there's like eight composers or nine composers on that whole uh gig but that was like super fun just because of the 
you know, it's right up our alley. So again, you know, we're just so fortunate and lucky because we get to work on these projects that scratch our itch of like doing the kind of music we want to do. And we get to actually do stuff that is, uh, you know, helping families and sort of resonating with people. So like, we've got the best of both worlds. I will say this is uh, we do get contacted quite often from uh, parents from, especially Daniel Tiger, who will, you know, say, hey, your son help my kid learn to use the potty or whatever, you know, and they're trying new foods. Uh, you know, there's a million lessons. Every episode has a lesson that they're trying to impart to preschool kids. And uh, it's done in a very smart way, typically, with a lot of research. So, um, you know, we can't take, uh, you know, total credit uh, for the songs. But this, for the songs being catchy and the, and the lessons getting through, through the power of music, uh, yeah, we can take credit for that. <laughs> it's a great team that we work with, actually, on that show where they we've got such a great songwriting system down. And, yeah, we can't take all the credit, but it's definitely a team effort. And they do a really good job researching all of the strategy hooks and all the choruses ahead of time and then giving us really solid directions so that we can make the best song possible. Uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to work on that show. It, it's quite fun. So. Um, before I continue, uh, Thomas, since you're a residential old person, do you have any questions like from your end as far as like things maybe I'm not picking up on as far as some of the, the stuff? The resident things? old person. <laughs> we, might have you, we might have you beat Thomas. Yeah, how old are you? 37. Okay, oh. so yeah, you're, yeah, no, yeah, we're old. We're beat by 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So that actually leads into some questions I have because I know you guys have probably been through at least a couple of interviews. You probably answered some of these questions before. So I'm going to ask you some different questions, and Great. I am very curious because you said that, you know, part of your musical inspiration or stuff like Nine Inch Nails and whatnot, that's all well and good. But today we are talking about, of course, your work primarily in animation. So my question to those of you who are talking, what is your favorite cartoon intro? Favorite cartoon intro? You know what? I am going to say... Cat in the Hat knows a lot about that. And I'm, even before we started working on it, I thought that theme song was uh, very good. That's oh, cool. Thomas, to clarify, yeah. is it stuff they've written or th things that they've just heard from other people? Sorry, I didn't write, we, we did not write the, the Cat in the Hat okay. theme song. It was written by a British gentleman who uh, scored the first uh, two seasons. And uh, it's one of my, it's always been one of my favorite theme songs to get him. I definitely am more interested, of course, in, in the what they did not write, but I, of course, also want to hear about what they did write, because it's always interesting to hear um, what people enjoyed that they worked on or what they think is the best of something they worked on. But, like, are there, other than Cat in the Hat, as you said, are there any other cartoons you guys watched when you were kids that, like, the theme song, like, is just a banger that keeps popping in your head over and over again, even at your age? Theme of that. It's so yeah, funny because you got me thinking about like favorite intros, and I'm like, Gravity Falls is pretty, my kids all into Gravity Falls right oh, now. Oh, it's great. So I'm like, oh, that's a great intro. And then, but then you're like, went from when I'm a kid, you know, intros like, okay, look, G.I. Joe, right? Like that <laughs> whole, that whole intro, and the guys like, then there's like the voiceover, like G.I. Joe is the special code name for the special commando unit. And it's like, it get, I just got goosebumps. Like it gets you all jacked up and stuff. And the guy's like, who's going to beat the bad guy? And it's, <laughs> he's like pretty badass, right? It gets you completely jacked up. Yeah. But but then we're to, but then at the next level of that was G.I. Joe, the movie intro. Oh, like, right. Now that's not a show. But the song and the quality of the animation, like I'll watch, I watch that twice a year just on YouTube. Just you're talking about, you're talking about the eighties movie. Yeah, yeah. GI Joe the movie. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, that very entire intro. Yeah. The entire sequence was actually yeah. done by Larry Houston. Oh wow. Yeah, the the animation sequence is amazing. It's like it is a standout from it. It fantastic. makes a promise that the rest of the movie does not live up. To that. <laughs> but it's, it's like fantastic, and the song, right? Because there's the the like cobra and it's like all dark and then there's a key yeah. change there's a key change who can turn the tide gi joe and then it's like yeah see oh man i'm getting tears like this is amazing that's what i uh, play on the fourth of july <laughs> yeah dude for real like it's it's super uh they don't make them like that anymore let's just say um, a team a team's a good a team nice yeah, but, it, but it's not an, are we we're talking animated those yeah, animated okay sorry yes. yeah um did you open it up to like live action and stuff. oh you can you can open up it anywhere if, if you don't have another favorite cartoon we can talk about live action music's music right 
Yeah. We're gonna look, we're gonna stop uh, when we're done this interview. I'm gonna be, be think back and be like, oh, why did I say my favorite? Uh, <laughs> I like the uh, Cuphead show uh, theme and intro. That's a unique one. Like, here's the problem: in the day of skipping intros, like the, that's what the day and age we're in now, where like you just people just skip it. Typically, I do too. I'm guilty of that. Yeah. For a, for a show to actually make me like want to watch the intro i think says a lot so the cuphead one is, is pretty fun uh as far as live action though right now the best intro out there is uh yellow jackets if anyone's oh. watching that uh and that's because they reveal clues from the upcoming season in each of the um intros so it encourages you to watch the the opening credits which i, I thought was pretty that. clever is it a different uh, piece of music every time, or is it? No, it's the same music? thing. But you keep seeing all these weird things. You're like, "What is that?" And then later in the season, when you see that moment, you're like, "Ah, oh, that's the." You're like, uh, "What's his name?" Uh, point the meme of the guy pointing at the screen or whatever. Like, that's <laughs> it. I, I watched, know that. I watched the first season, and I think I skipped every intro. So I, yeah, I dude. No, no. There's some r amazing clues and things. Like it's very, very cleverly uh, done. But uh, and then as far as the animation stuff that we've done, it's for me, it's got to be the total drama theme and uh opening animation that brian wrote that wonderful theme and it's sort of like i don't i don't mean i didn't really do much on that my wife and i sang backing vocals at the end <laughs> uh and i always joke because it's because we needed bad singers to like sound off key so like my wife is perfect for that um so um so that basically i i don't mean to be hyperbolic but i think that's like could could be an all-time classic animated intro now because it's got it's been around for so long it's everyone catchy. loves that theme song right uh Who props did? to you bry for that one i was gonna mention that one because that was the first actual song i feel like i've ever written like sat yeah. down with a guitar and read yeah. it out with some lyrics and uh yeah, it was a first I was there the day you were writing it. Actually, my yeah. wife and I were in Toronto and we went into the studio and you had the acoustic out and you were yeah. writing it. And I was kind of chuckling to myself like, <laughs> yeah, this is going to go well. Yes. And then uh, guess what? Man, yeah. it was awesome. You rocked it. So, yeah, I love saying it wrong. We should give Graham credit. He uh, rocked the performance. Of yeah. The guitars and singing. He's our he's our resident singer. Yeah. He's nice. incredible. Well, I, I also have a couple more questions here specifically yeah. about your work. So, all right, you guys did work on George of the Jungle. Did you guys by any chance do the intro for George of the Jungle as well? We redid it because the first season, um, they went a different approach, uh, you know, away from the 60s intro. Um, then when they brought it to us, we asked the producers if we could recreate the 60s one with new production. Uh, so we hired, a, you know, they recorded separately, but we hired a brass section. And uh, and like basically recreated it uh, faithful to the original '60s, '70s, whenever the original one came out. That's really. actually really really good to know because it leads into my next question. So oh. the original George of the Jungle song was written by like St you know Stan Worth, Sheldon Allman. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you feel any pressure having to walk in those shoes? Uh, not oh, kind of. I don't remember feeling too much pressure. I just wanted to make it sound because I. Uh, speaking of iconic theme songs, I would I would put that as up there. Oh, definitely. That and the Inspector Gadget, especially if you're going the full span of animated shows, uh, definitely George of the Jungle is one of my favorites. So, yeah, I I mean I listened to it very closely. We all listened to it very closely and tried to uh, you know learn from it. So. Uh, let me add to that just for a second, because I would just say there's always pressure, right? Like the, the thing is, we may not notice the pressure because we've just learned to live with it. Mm -hmm. There's pressure every time I sit down at this keyboard to write something, right? Like my and every single time I think I can't do, I'm not, I'm gonna fail. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that's pretty normal. And part of the gig, part of this gig, is learning to live with that pressure and being under pressure. And we're at the point now where I like, I'm sure there was pressure as we were doing it, but it's, you just sort of roll with it. Like that's the gig, right? Yeah. yeah. I remember being very proud. I remember being very proud of it. Okay. Yeah. It turned out awesome. My favorite was the French Canadian version that we had to overdub oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> with the French lyrics. It was amazing. It sounded great. You should try to find it online somewhere. It was great. Yeah. Even our version, I'm not sure if our version gets too much, uh, 
I don't know. It's, I'm curious, actually. I've never gone on a Google or a YouTube search for it, but I'm curious if our version gets um, shown. Because, I, like I said, it was a second or third, second season version of the show. Um, yeah. Anyway, I digress. Well, I, I have a couple more questions here. Yeah. Uh, in Canada, I believe it works off of specific unions for, like, voice actors. Oh, that was going to be my uh, question, too, as far as how it works with the unions in Canada. Go ahead, Thomas. Actor. Double question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, didn't mean to. Didn't mean to. No, no, that. that's great. Uh, yeah, like I, I know. Okay, so a little bit of a disclosure here. The Canadian animation I primarily watch because you know I'm not not as old as you guys. I'm a little bit younger. Uh, was stuff like Beast Wars out of Mainframe yeah. Entertainment. So I know that like they had a very specific. Um, what's the word? Now I'm blanking. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Motif. Some not motif, uh, aesthetic. Not that it's a <laughs> union, a specific union they have yeah. to go through to do these things. So oh, I was yeah. wondering if, if music is the same way in Canada. No, really, it's kind of the wild west. They <laughs> prefer you not to use actra, um, not to use actor talent often because uh, you know it, it ups the budget significantly. Um, sorry, on the as singers as a theme song singer or whatever, which I mean, usually it's just one of us that sings it. Um, sometimes we go at it, are added to it as a, on contract, like with Daniel Tiger, that stuff's all above board, but I mean, obviously uh, sometimes we're, we sing on things, um, and just, I mean, we have to, and then if a voice makes it, then that's typically what happens. But I mean, as far as, uh, AF, you know, there's also the AF and the, uh, the musicians union, um, you know, some just some more for live playing or or yeah. orchestras, big bands, things like that, like session players, kind of, mm -hmm. so than composers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we okay. kind of as composers, you kind of squeeze, you kind of squeeze through. There's no one really, uh, you know, about me. No, I'm holding us to typically. I have one more question about this, and I'm going to hand it back off to Rachel. So hopefully, I won't talk everybody's head off. Um, no, you're great, man. So, a bit of a different from George of the Jungle is you guys worked on Bakugan, and of course, Bakugan is not a, a wholly you know Western thing. It was something that was created in Japan. So, mm -hmm. from what I understand, because you guys scored music for it, that's essentially uh, going over the music that was originally in the series. Obviously, you're not using the same one. So, my question to you guys is. How challenging is it to score for something that's already essentially finished, that already had a previous music track, and if you guys have ever gotten grief from maybe hyper-obsessive fanboys over it? <laughs> so the, the version of Bakugan that we worked on was actually a reboot. It was called Bakugan Battle Planet, and it was a brand new uh, animated through Nelvana in Toronto. Ooh, nice. uh, again, another classic animation, animation house studio. I'm yeah. going to go as far back as like, I watched Ewoks and Droids from them. Oh, okay. Dude. Like back in the day. Okay. So working with them, uh, they, so it was all brand new animation. We scored it right from scratch. Believe, uh, the, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I believe that the animation might be done in Japan there. And I believe yes. Japan, they're Japan, but it's done concurrently. I believe that the Jap there is a composer who scores the Japanese version. I believe. Didn't know that. I could be wrong. I heard about this. I, I, this is, if so, this is the first that I've heard of this. We do the world outside of Japan, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. This might be on Bakugan version one. <laughs> I think that was version one that we didn't work on, mm -hmm. from my understanding. I feel like I, I would have heard about this at this point because we're like five seasons in. <laughs> I, know, I guess the answer is we've never we've never gotten grief. On yeah. It. Uh, yeah. And apparently, uh, yeah, we don't even know. Uh, yeah, but I don't know. I believe our version of the score is the worldwide version, and the if there is an alternate nice. one, not. Um, Dennis. We'll Google it and get back to you. <laughs> Plus the guys that. Uh, uh, because I believe Spin Master owns the property of that one. And yeah. I would also say we don't have any grief. Like, I watch a lot of anime myself, and I would say, uh, you know, there's a big inspiration there, a background there for me personally. And I think everything we do is pretty spot on. In fact, I think it's better than a lot of the anime. It's not all of them. Some of those animes have incredible scores that just totally blow me away. Uh, but I think, like, we do a pretty good job overall. 
Uh, and then we had a little bit of a background too, like Meta Jets was anime, and even though Metal Gear wasn't necessarily anime, it was sort of in that genre or that world of like cyberpunky kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so so far no one has complained. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Most of our complaints are for Paw Patrol. Like, I go on Twitter, and I'll, I'll search, like, Paw Patrol music, and oh, it's, no. like, almost always parents just like, oh, my God, if I have to hear this one more time. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know you've done your job right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, like, I totally get it, too. I think it's hilarious. Like, you know, I, you can't take any of that stuff personally. I completely get it. Like, yeah. uh, so. Totally. We, we hope we've learned. Uh, we do try to... Uh, kiss up to the parents a little bit in our music <laughs> like we try to avoid the preschool sounding stuff and even if we write a song we try to produce it as if we're producing you know a, a song for the grown-ups you know <laughs> we're usually yeah. giving them, we're usually giving us like write something that like, maybe the beatles would have written <laughs> no something in that area code and then usually usually we borrow the production of it uh you know we don't take any mel- obviously you don't you stay away from the melodies or um, you know, in some cases, even the chord progressions, you try to avoid that, but, but we definitely try to sound inspired by this. You learn pretty quick, uh, that everyone's a critic and yeah. just in the arts in general, no matter what your what path is like, you know, everyone's going to have an opinion and they're going to share it publicly. And, yeah. uh, so you just got to get a thick skin pretty quick and like not take it personally mm-hmm. and stuff. Like the big thing is like, everybody is an auto tune expert when it comes to Daniel Tiger. Cause that's the big one, like all over the internet is like, there's so much auto tune on these vocals and like, fair enough, you know, Hey, good. That's good feedback to get from the audience. Like that's pretty neat. You know, 30 years ago, you didn't get that kind of feedback, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a neat time to be alive, but yeah, like, uh, you gotta have a thick skin in general for that kind of stuff. Before I hand this back to to Rachel, I want to just go ahead and tell you, uh, just for the sake of clarity, what my favorite, uh, music scores from cartoons were yeah. it's only it's primarily two um yeah. i love the work of shuki levy and haim saban on the yes. filmation cartoon specifically he man it's a beautiful score oh yeah I can listen to it and of course i love uh bernie yeah. bernard yeah. hoffer's work on thundercats and silverhawks so uh, ah yeah nice the full orchestra is fantastic it's beautiful so i just yeah. wanted to share that real quick and back to you rachel i was, I was gonna be like gonna how dare you talk list. about yourself here that's not no, <laughs> that's a great list and uh, the he-man one especially that opening there's a good opening right there's a all-time classic where he's like explaining all of the plot and everything all in one concise like 30 second thing with a brilliant soundtrack uh, you got me thinking about Batman the Animated Series, though, Shirley oh, Walker. Shirley Walker. That's probably right. the best all-time, like, if I had to pick all-time A++ number one animated score of all time, like, it it has to be that just because every episode was an original orchestral score, and there's, like, 200 episodes or something. Like, yeah, the, like the sheer amount of quality work that she did is mind-blowing, and nobody's really kind of touched that since, in my in my opinion. Yeah, but she uh, we lost her. Yeah, I know she's fantastic. Her work on Escape from LA, like I listen to the Escape from LA soundtrack like constantly. She's killer, man. Okay. Um, Anyways, so back. Yeah, we've nerded out enough. All right. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> Gotta just press the delete button. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, um, so <laughs> um, luckily, luckily, I don't have to do the post. So you know. Um, yeah. But um, so you touched a little bit about unions, but um, I was going to ask more as far as like the technical aspect, the boring technical aspects of like how you kind of build up like your repertoire and portfolio enough to kind of like, you know, do you guys get an agent? Well, I, obviously you have a, kind of a marketing agent now, weighty person. Um, but like, how do you build up to that point? Like, I guess from someone from the outside looking in, how do you kind of start getting those more, how do you kind of break in um, from that perspective? And then I have a generic one after that that just like, you know, uh, advice you'd give to the young people that maybe we haven't touched on before, so. We are, we are unique in that we've never had an agent. Like we've had like the odd one that's tried for a month um, or whatever, <laughs> or, uh, you know, we, we've looked for agents and, uh, and the people have turned us down. I've always thought, oh my, um, but, it's turned out we kind of are our our own agents um you know just to, i this is back to the whole one um gig leading to the next once you get a couple of cartoons on your belt on mm-hmm. your belt 
uh, we were the ones who were reaching out, uh, you know, and just sending out an email every once in a while. And hopefully you have some kind of reel. I, our first animation reel was only Total Drama Island and uh, a show, little show called World of Quest, which was on WB Network back in the 2009 that we did right after, because of Total Drama Island, we got this cartoon. So we put together a reel, which you had to do back then. Uh, we, we still kind of do a little sizzle reel now, but uh, yeah, it was very short and it gave very little information about what we were capable of. <laughs> and, uh, we just said, here's the good thing about animation shows, especially in Toronto, is they, it's down to a big demoing system. It's all auditions. Um, and we have auditioned for almost every, almost every series we work on, we've had to audition either a little score sample or a theme song, which led to the score, or just sometimes just only the theme. But I would say this to any new starting out composer, just contact the animation houses <clears throat> or producers that you might know and say, hey, I, I'd add me to your demo list. Because it honestly costs them no money. They're to, they'll reach out to you mm -hmm. or maybe not. They might only want like three people to audition for it because they don't want to get inundated. But I think especially with a theme song, I'd encourage producers, even ones where we're you know, we're trying to get the theme, I encourage them to uh, look everywhere for a theme song because it's, uh, they, could, they go under a lot of scrutiny and they got to have, they got to have an amazing hook. Mm -hmm. There's so many things. They got to set the tone for the episode. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm all in favor of, um, you know, demos, wide demos mm -hmm. for theme songs. And that's how we got our first bunch of shows. I think we are one of 20, uh, 21 or 22 demos for Total Drama. Um, and same with almost every show we've done, like theme song wise, you know, if you're lucky, they pick you out of like 20 some odd themes. So, okay. Yeah, I, and, and they won't turn, they won't turn anyone away if, not, if they're smart. <laughs> it's, free, it's free and they get a song out of it and then someone might just score a home run. Oh, there yeah. might be, like I said, my first song I ever wrote was the Total Drama Island theme song. And, uh, yeah, and I, still I think favorite. that's a strength that we had early on was we weren't afraid to make phone calls. We weren't afraid to take meetings or create like we created our own contacts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we didn't sit on our laurels. And I'm not saying that composers today do that, but there, there I do sort of see a lot more of that where I think uh, composers are sort of waiting for things to happen to them rather than being proactive. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a lot more composers in the game now than when we started out. So it was it was a little bit of a more open playing field for us uh, yeah. 23 years ago with our VHS demo reel. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, you had to get a VCR for our meetings. Hey, can we book the VCR? <laughs> Uh, and then, well, then we went to DVD, and now we're at the point where we don't have a uh, really a demo reel. We have some stuff on our website. It's sort of like uh, as soon as people Google us, there's enough stuff that kind of shows up. So it's sort of snowballed itself, uh, like it's a self-perpetuating demo reel that's just sort of out there. Um, but uh, yeah, I would just say uh, that uh, that advice of like be proactive. There's another thing too, which is the animation community is, at least in Toronto, uh, is pretty small and incestuous and people move around from company to company. And if you make a good impression with one person at one company, who knows when they'll show up on another show. We've had that happen a lot where they start to Paw reach Patrol. out to us, right? Yeah, Paw Patrol. Now that was Jamie from MetaJets, correct? Jamie from World of Quest. World of Quest, right. He's the first See? producer on Paw Patrol, and he's like, I want you guys to we had demoed for the theme of Paw Patrol, which we don't do, by the way. The, the, Paw, the Paw Patrol theme song was written by a guy named Michael Smitty Smith in Los Angeles. But um, but they asked they asked us to do the score, and it was because we had worked with them on another show mm -hmm. at another company. And he moved over from a different company to work on Paw Patrol as the first producer and or director. He's the first director of the series and uh, he asked us to be part of it what a great gift that was yeah. <laughs> but i think it speaks to the importance of your reputation and your reputation is everything if you don't have a good reputation you've got nothing mm -hmm. and so uh i think we we were lucky that we put the work and the time in to to be uh easy and fun to work with to be to like always deliver on time uh, to save people's asses in emergencies to not complain like these are all things i think uh, make for a good impression. Mm -hmm. uh, a hand of criticism so, well. 
yeah, handle criticism well, right? Like that's part of it, right? Just rolling with stuff, uh, being easy to work with and fun to work with. They will remember that mm -hmm. because that's valuable, right? And so that opened doors for us as well as the years have gone on. So treat every gig that you work on, uh, you know, with that kind of respect and down the road, it will come back and, and pay, pay back tenfold you know? oh yeah yeah i just wanted to, to cut in and i asked that question too because like i'm i'm traditionally an animator and artist lady so like my perspective too especially with la specifically is very much like even if you have like x y you know you have a great portfolio a great demo weird like someone still has to take that chance like in the studio to even like hey get go get you go get unionized and then we can work work with you so like you know it, it's it sounds like it's very nice to like or it just seems more relaxed in Canada or the Canadian environment because it's just a smaller community in general. But, you know, it just seems like it's much more um, competitive in other places. So that was my, that's why I was curious about it. I could see that. When we, you know, when we started, there's probably 10 to 20 composing teams in Canada. Mm -hmm. Maybe not Canada, sorry, I'd say Toronto-based composing teams, whether they're four people or a company full of eight people. Or who knows hey composers and now i'd say it's just like i wouldn't want to start now <laughs> yeah it, there's a lot more com composers i mean you know that's kind of neat right because it's 20 years that was 23 years ago so there's oh, been 20 talking. years of the education has changed the technology has changed it's a real possibility like our professor at, at uh college specifically said whatever you do don't move to toronto and start open a music house and start writing music for like our teacher told us like don't do it mm -hmm. and i think it's the opposite now where they're encouraged like it's a dream that people can actually attain now and so there's a lot more players in the game which is great but you know it also makes it more difficult to stand out uh and all of that so i would i would say too rachel is uh when we first started and this is i i my my dad, who has no experience in the entertainment industry. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those. <laughs> he said something really smart to me, though. He said, right now, because I was frustrated, we weren't getting trusted. You know, we weren't getting the, the big gigs. And this is when we were in, you know, twenty bunch of 23-year-olds. Looking back, I wouldn't trust us either. I um, had that same reaction. <laughs> I remember getting really upset one night. Yeah. Why don't we ever get the blah, blah, blah? Like, yeah, totally. And, and what he said, what he said is, right now, someone has to take a chance on you. You're not the safe choice or whatever. Um, and like if they, if you screw up again, it gets their ass. Like they'll get fired. Whereas they use if they use an established uh, artist, you know, I don't know, say an artist in general, because this can apply to any creative. Uh, use an established person. If they screw up, then you can say, well, I worked with the same, I worked with the guy everyone uses or whatever. So, uh, ironically, and that's not ironic. It's not irony. But now I guess we're the safe choice. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in animation, anyway, people can look at us as a having a track record and we've done, you know, these shows for Nickelodeon and uh, PBS and, you know, what have you. And people say, well, I just call them. They, they, you know, they, they know what they're doing. And, mm -hmm. that. and that's such a, that's such a nice feeling. It's a, yeah, it's, it is. It's, <laughs> it's happened so gradually, the shift. Yeah. It only occurred to me like a few years ago. I was like, Hey, we're the safe choice. Your dad was right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, there was another thing too. What was I going to say? The the people that took the chance on us, I think the first time, uh, was Nine Story out of the blue uh, for uh, Daniel Tiger. I feel like they I, like was it was it fresh? fresh? I think I think they total drama. It was the first cartoon. Yeah, they took a big. I'd yeah, say. but I also feel like with like they saw like oh like it wasn't as much of a risk because they saw like oh these guys could actually yeah. pull it off. Whereas yeah. Daniel Tiger was like, we're going to be doing full voice cast in your place, writing these songs. Like, I, like I wouldn't have picked us, but <laughs> I'm glad they did uh, because, yeah, that was a major turning point. I also wanted to point out, too, just for those keeping track at home, like I said earlier, it's not, it hasn't been all rainbows and lollipops. Like, our very first animated show we actually got let go from. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was, a, that sucked horribly. Mm -hmm. But looking back... I'm so glad it happened. It was almost like it had to be part of the story for us to fail and to learn from that. And that brings me to like, you were saying a minute ago about like general advice for people and stuff. We have so much, but <laughs> one thing that I've been coming around to lately as sort of my number one thing I like to impart is the importance of failure. Uh, and in so many ways, and I actually think failure might be more important than success. 
because without failure, uh, I wouldn't have learned. I wouldn't have gotten better at things. Uh, I wouldn't have had a thicker skin. Uh, I wouldn't have learned how to savor the victories. Like if all you do is win all the time, then it's kind of, you sort of lose touch. So it, it, it makes me savor where we're at more now because of all of the hard times that we went through. And every single time uh, that we failed, uh, we emerged on the other side stronger and better. So it's like, I don't know, like that's almost kind of the most important thing is to like embrace all of the down stuff that happens because it's it should happen and it will make you better. Right. You yeah, it's, um, it's I, I think too, it's easier to like, to see that on like from the perspective of like, oh, well we, we made it too. So it's, I get what you're saying. I think sometimes it's hard for people to really like embrace that when it just feels like fail, fail, fail. But like, I, it's I hard understand. It's to see in the yeah. moment. Uh, absolutely. Um, that's one thing I wish if I could open a time portal and just tell my 21 year old self, like, Mm -hmm. one thing it's like don't worry the failure's okay every like this is all you're gonna be all good just because yeah it did it does feel a lot worse when you're in it you're totally right yeah, totally. like i said we went through five years of failure anyone who wasn't uh, uh like i think 20 is uh, maybe as young and used to being as poor as us <laughs> uh, definitely given up before us so I, I think we were in a place a place of kind of I don't, I don't know how to word it, but we were in a unique position where um, we just could take it, I guess, or whatever. Right, you right. Know? And I just want to, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, but, it, but like James says, it was depressing. Like I was ready to give up and I was getting family being like, so when are you going to get a real job, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Like, no, it, it sucked. <laughs> like I always say this thing or whatever, and I don't always like saying it, but when a young composer asked me like, hey, what advice do you have? I'm always like, yeah, don't do this. This is, you're insane to think about doing this and uh and again i told you our professor told us that at school i had a number of people tell me like don't do this and i ignored them completely because i knew in my heart that this is what i was meant to do so if somebody really knows in their heart like this is what i was born to do they're not going to listen to me anyways but maybe i could help save somebody the pain and the struggle and spare them all of that like if they weren't really supposed to do this because Hard. That does happen a lot. People can spend a decade doing this and and then just give up, right? Like, mm -hmm. or it wasn't maybe it w it wasn't the right call for them. So uh, yeah. So just to reiterate that, it 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 did suck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't want to be. I didn't want to like pin you on like it sucks. You know, I'm sorry, but like I also like I I think it's sometimes important to it's you know you got to be realistic sometimes. Anyway, let's get. Yes. Let's move on from the sad stuff. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but like, I, I also wanted to throw in um, too, like I, I work with a nonprofit production team and we do a lot of fan stuff. And even though people might like not, like they might not be sure how to take that. Like, I think sometimes too, it's just good to like artist, composer, whatever you're doing, just to kind of get out there and join group projects because you kind of build up your repertoire that way and it, it's easier to it's easier for an employer or to another person to trust that because there's not only like you delivered the the the, the product or whatever it was but you also kind of did it in a group environment and you know a lot of times too for at least from my perspective I'll throw it back in a second but um a lot of you know artistic types are very like introverted and you know shy and it's hard to get a real reading on like how they're really feeling and stuff so having yeah the experience of working with a group regardless of what environment it is i think just is kind of a safe net for people who you know want to go from point a to point b so like that's why i'm just like hey if you like things go find things to do and just put it on your resume and um you know hope it turns, it turns out okay but absolutely um do you guys have any other i know we talked a lot about like real world advice and stuff like that do you have do you guys have any other just notes you want to end on because i think we've exhausted um everything unless yeah this Thomas... has been great by the way like thanks for the thanks for the great conversation it's always fun chatting about all this stuff <laughs> well yeah i, I was just gonna that. echo one last thing that i'm not sure if brian brought it up this call or if i'm uh thinking about another interview but brian you were talking about the importance of finding uh partners or allies you know we're talking about working in groups and stuff like that uh like i wouldn't be here if i hadn't met these guys you know, I don't yeah. know where my career would be. So yeah, I feel sorry for that. 
it's, it's tricky. I can't imagine being a composer because, I mean, it's a lot of moral support. I can't imagine being a soul person working yeah. alone and taking, say, some of the rejection I've seen or that we've taken and not having that ear to like be like, oh, man, that sucked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Speaking of com- composers, I have to ask, does, has anybody here other than me uh, watched any of the content on a channel called Defunct Land? Negative. All right. De- I'm gonna p- yes, Defunct Land. I'm going to put it in the chat here in a moment. Please do. But this, this gentleman was curious about who composed the four um, keys for the Disney theme, the do, 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 and he could not find any information. And he does an entire documentary about how he found the guy who did it, and it is extremely ah, fascinating. I got to see that for sure. Let me go ahead and pull it up because I'll put it in the chat because I think you guys would really like it because it's a really it's a really heartwarming story by the end of it. Nice. Yeah, sometimes people who do the logos kind of get lost in the, um, you know, lost in the whirlwind we've like, done a few of those too there's basically every little thing you can think of that with, with music on it i feel like we've done it one time or another it's true uh Some... to bring it all the all back around by the way i would uh you know being allies with graham and brian and uh you know i was saying we were like the ninja turtles we're more like the gi joe squad <laughs> oh, oh, <God. laughs> you gotta get a fight over her snake eyes I am not Snake Eyes. I'm definitely Snow Job with this beard, okay? So, uh, <laughs> nice. Or a gung ho. But uh, here's the thing, though, is that you know, for young composers, like you know, find those allies, especially if maybe they're stronger in a department that you're not as strong at. And the thing is, I feel like we all sort of have our little GI Joe specialties here and there, mm-hmm. and we can rely on each other for that. And it's just like I don't know. It's it's made all of our lives easier. Our careers better. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. Uh, and we've also been fortunate to be partners for 23 years. I mean, it's, a business is essentially a marriage, right? So it's like, you know, we've been together. And I and I didn't even mention, I knew Graham from high school, from grade 11. So oh, that's, wow. So, so we've been in each other's lives for so long. We're so fortunate because, like, how many bands break up after two years, right? Like, it's hard to find a dynamic where you get along with people and stuff. But man, I like, you know, if you can find we again, we've been fortunate that it's worked out, but uh, I can't recommend that enough, like allying up with other composers, like don't see them as competition, see it as a team, you know, Mm -hmm. or if you're a writer and a lot of writers write together, you know, there's a writing, so many writing teams I can think of off the top of my head and director teams. Now I see a lot of people who co-direct movies and stuff, man, I think it's just, uh, I think you can be stronger together. Yeah, I, I really like that's a that's a nice way to to kind of end on a happy note. So uh, speaking of other happy notes, uh, where can people find you guys um, on the Internet? Do you guys have anything to plug as far as if people want to follow your work or besides IMDb and that like? So we've got our website, VoodooHighwayMusic.com, which just has some of our info on it and our wonderful pictures and some of our demos of our works and stuff. And then you can follow us on Twitter at Voodoo Highway Music, I believe. Uh, and then we all have personal Twitters as well. I think I'm at James Chapel. Uh, and there's a, you know, there's the Instagram stuff. If you just search for Voodoo Highway, it'll show up on all of the all the major platforms. Hmm. We're not uh, we're not totally active, but we are semi active. So <laughs> yeah. People. James, that's, yeah. James. That's better yeah. than we nothing. Do, we do what we can. <laughs> The reality is we're so busy composing all the time that there's like very little time to do social media stuff. But, uh, you know, we do, uh, I think less is more in that department for us. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it only takes so much of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for your time. I, ho- I hope you had fun. <laughs> yeah, this was a blast. Thanks so much. Hopefully we can do it again one day. Yeah, thank yeah, you. yeah. Um, so uh, just as uh, I guess end post person here, but as far as um, it works from here is it's probably going to be a two week turnaround till the episode's done. And we also do artistic headshots. So um, I didn't see any headshots in the, this may be more of a Maddie question. I didn't see any headshots in the um, description. I'm sure there's, is there photos of you guys on the website? 
There are the yeah, our bio photos are on on the website. Okay. Yeah. Um, my follow up. I can send them over to you. Okay, sure. Um, and then my follow up is we do our the guests in a specific style, like artistic style of like the thing they worked on. Do you guys have a preference yeah. between like Paw Patrol or Troll Drama, or if you want GI Joe, something you know you just like, then we can do that too. I think you should go Troll Drama because I think that will be like as far as this medium, like that's the people that will attract. Uh, the most to listen to this episode, I would say. Like, okay. I'm not going to get the Paw Patrol kids looking at <laughs> our, our interview. <laughs> well, you might get the parents. I'm like, who do who do I, who do I send my emails to? <laughs> There's going to be that one really snarky five-year-old that has an iPad. I know. And they they exist. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Daniel Tiger if you want to. Recording stopped. Yeah, the, uh, that might be fun. Yeah, we can leave it to you guys. Whatever you guys think looks best. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thanks again for your time, guys, and I'll keep Maddie posted as far as the um, the release schedule and stuff like that. So you. Sweet. Oh, and thanks for the links. I've opened both of these links here, and I'm gonna check those out and everything. I appreciate you sending those. Yeah, YouTube of course, links. of That's course. Nice. Well, have a have a good rest of the night, guys, and um. Me too. Yeah. I don't know. Just thanks for coming. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Sleigh <laughs> bells. Bye. All right. <laughs> See you guys. Yeah. Later. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to Animation Communication on YouTube, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider. We are really hoping the show makes a difference in how people view animation as well as media as a whole as well as giving and providing advice for people all over the world who like or want to join the animation and media industry. If you like what you heard, please remember to show support by giving a like, a follow, rating those five stars, as well as subscribing to our main I Love Kim Possible A Lot channel on YouTube and turn your notification on. New episodes of Animation Communication come out every Wednesday at 6 a.m. EST on podcasting platforms and 4 p.m. EST on YouTube. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at The KP Podcast for information about upcoming guests, episodes, and more, as well as our hosts, KP and Riddle, at I Love KP A Lot, and at Riddle Lightning on social media. I'm Kat, and thank you for being part of our community. See you next time on Animation Communication. <laughs> <laughs>